Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now my guest today has managed to combine a successful career as a stand-up comic with his expertise in economics and taxation. Dominic Frisby has performed at the Edinburgh Festival. He had a show there called Let's Talk About Tax. He was also a columnist for Money Week and he's written a number of books on the subject. Uh, most recently, it is Daylight Robbery, How Tax Shaped Our Past and Will Change Our Future. Um, Dominic, good morning to you. Um, Hi, Peter. Thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, I have to ask, it's a pretty, uh, how do you manage to make taxation funny? I mean, that's, that's a real skill, I would have thought. Well, I have to say, of all the shows I've done, Peter, this wasn't the funniest. <laughs> this, um, it was more, it was, uh, it, it, I had a sort of Latin motto for it, which was uh, always interesting, occasionally amusing. Right. So the, uh, but the, it, 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 it's such a big and interesting subject. I was convinced back in the late noughties and early part of this decade that if we were going to save the world, um, from the large state and all the things that come with it, yeah. we needed to reform our system of money. Mm -hmm. And everything hinged on that. It's only our system of fiat money where governments can create money and set interest rates and so on that gives them the control and the power that they do within a society. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to save ourselves, we need independent money once upon a time, once again. And, um, and I wrote one book about this life after the state. And then while I was writing, writing that Bitcoin was invented and that here was a new sort of technological solution. And I'd always been a big gold bug prior to that. And then um, in the years after I'd written Bitcoin, I was thinking more and more about it. And then I, I started thinking it's not just our system of money, but it's also our system of tax. Yeah. And tax is the way that rulers Tax is power yeah. is something I say in the book. And if you have a, whether it's a government or a king or an emperor, whatever, whoever the ruler is or whatever the ruler is, if they lose their tax revenue, they lose their power. It's, it's not just that, that tax is power. Tax is also how you shape a society. Um, and you, you, you know, you determine the destiny of that society by the way you tax it whether it's people will be prosperous or poor, free or subordinated. All these things are determined by our system of tax. And I just started reading, reading, reading more about the history of tax. And this, it's surprisingly little. It's like tax is sort of like a subset of economics Yes. Um, at university. It's not a subject in itself. But when you start thinking about the fact that, you know, there has never been a society without taxation of some kind. The very first taxes were levied in ancient Mesopotamia. Of course, we didn't pay with cash or money like we do now. Tax was, you know, a share of your produce or a share of your labor. But even so, there still um, existed this sense of tax. And probably there was this idea of a sense of duty to the greater collective, even in the hunter gatherer societies that preceded civilization. And then you can start you going through history and you, you suddenly realize that Almost every great event in history has behind it. There is some kind of tax story without which that event would have unfolded in a very different way. And so every war is funded by some kind of tax, either during or after the after the event. Mm -hmm. Every um, revolution is usually some kind of uprising against some kind of in, in, injustice perpetrated by the tax system. Every rebellion, every revolt, every um, uh um, every conquest is about taking control of the tax base, the land, the labor, the produce, the profits. But even apparently unconnected events like, you know, the birth of Christ. Mary and Joseph were only in Bethlehem because Augustus Caesar was levying a census or a, or, or he was, according to which version of the story in, in St. Luke, he was actually levying a tax. Now, Mary and Joseph wouldn't have been in, in Bethlehem were it not for this tax. Right. And had they not been in Bethlehem, Christianity would never have evolved in the way that it did. So even at the birth of Christ and at his death, you know, the, the crime for which he was crucified was forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. So at the birth and death of Christ, there's a tax story. There's also incredible tax stories at the birth of Islam and at the birth of Judaism as well. And so, you know, first men on the moon, NASA was a tax funded operation. You, and once you start looking at the world through this prism of taxation, suddenly why events happened in the way that they did and why things are as they are now and how things are going to be in the future all becomes a lot clearer. So well, that's why I sort of become obsessed with the subject. It's not that funny, but it's quite interesting. <laughs> it, 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 um, I think this perspective, you know, 
of looking at history through taxation. I mean, it's fascinating. But but where do you think the kind of uh, distinction came between left and right in the attitudes to taxation? In the sense that, you know, in a way, the, what you're describing is a kind of collective responsibility, isn't it? Um, but there is this view now that somehow, you know, if you're on the right, you're anti, you know, you're, you tend to be anti-taxation or wanting to get it low. On the left, you know, you're very, very, well, pro-tax or you have less of a problem with tax. When did that kind of develop, that, that sort of distinction? Well, there's been a battle throughout history between those who would pay tax and those who would who would collect it <laughs> right but i think what you're talking about is the sort of birth of you know until maybe the 20th century taxes were used in the uk you know to pay for wars to pay for a police force to pay for the defense of the nation basic order um and it was only really uh, you know with i suppose the both birth of social democracy was 1911, the National Insurance Act. Yeah. David Lloyd George and Winston Churchill, and and but the National Insurance was basically copying the Friendly Societies because the Friendly Societies had were and the Church were responsible for delivering healthcare, welfare, education, all these things that are now delivered by government, and they were so successful at the level they were operated. Lloyd George and Winston Churchill were trying to copy them at a national level, and so we had National Insurance, but really. I, I see 1914 as the beginning of the time when things started to go wrong. Right. OK. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. The First World War. And, you know, until the First World War, there's a famous passage at the beginning of AJP Taylor's um, book is, you know, an ordinary Englishman barely noticed the existence of the state in his life. We didn't have passports, mm. for example. Mm. And we could travel freely from country to country. And it was within with and, and I see tax, by the way, as as almost as a measure of freedom. Mm. Maggie Thatcher was famous for saying you can't have freedom unless you have economic freedom. Mm. And the more taxed you are, the less, particularly with income tax, the less of your own labor you own. Mm. And so, you know, at one sense, you have, you know, one extreme, you have anarchy where there's no taxes at all and everyone's free and they have total ownership of their labor. And then at the other extreme, you have you know, maybe a totalitarian state, North Korea or something, where none of your labor is owned and and none of your produce. Mm. You could also say in 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 a, in a way that slavery is like the most extreme taxation of at all because you don't own any of your mm. own labor, you don't own your own body, you don't own anything. So you know, we could hark back to you know ancient Athens, for example, one of the most enlightened civilizations in history where taxes were voluntary, mm. but they still had slaves. <laughs> yeah. So they might yeah. have been so keen on the tax system. But anyway, that's a, that's a sort of slightly separate argument. But the birth of this idea that we are paying taxes to uh, pay for health care and welfare and education, all these things which the government provides, not the church or the friendly society or any other private body, sort of started in... in 1911 then it, it's like all these things they don't start on a date it things evolve and, and of course you know the birth of the welfare state after the second world war um and what tends to happen with taxes and this is why it's kind of opposite to today and and um in covid19 and the coronavirus leaders find it very difficult to levy new taxes in times of peace yeah and there's History is littered with examples of this. The most recent famous example is perhaps Margaret Thatcher's poll tax, mm. which actually brought her down. And she was actually introduced the poll tax because she was trying to bring accountability to local councils. Mm. But unfortunately, it wasn't the local councils that was held accountable. It was her. Yes. And, and poll tax brought her down. And even things like, you know, George Osborne's pasty tax or Ed Miliband's mansion tax, they, you know, they were ridiculed for them. Leaders find it difficult to levy new taxes. They often need some kind of crisis, usually a war mm. in which to levy them. And so the First World War brought income tax. Well, it, it was actually the Napoleonic Wars that brought income tax to every man in the UK. But then it sort of disappeared. And it was only the highest um, earners that paid income tax. The First World War brought income tax to every man in the UK and also not just tax itself, but higher levels, mm -hmm. higher rates of tax. And here's a beautiful tax story for you. 
Because many women joined the workforce in World War I mm. and then started paying taxes, this was a major justification in the argument to their being given the vote. Mm -hmm. So there's even a, a tax story behind universal suffrage. Uh, Simon Herfer said uh, to us recently that, in fact, the state as we understand it, you could pretty much see its origins in the First World War. Um, and uh, the point is, I know it's a cliche, um, but, you know, taxis never disappear, do they, after that? I mean, you know, no. it's, it's, they, they are only ever going to increase. Um, and, this is um, what happens. They... The, they get implemented with the crisis yeah. and then after the crisis has passed they never go back to the levels they were before the crisis began right. they come back a little bit but they never go back to where they were world war ii ordinary americans didn't pay income tax until 1942 the revenue act of 1942 you know brought income tax to ordinary americans and they've been paying it ever since yes and even the financial crisis of 2008 you know, gave us zero interest rate policies and quantitative easing and all these things, which are just a stealth tax. They're just another form of taxation, They're another form of, of wealth it's extraction, passing, you know, it, it's not an official tax, but the, the, the effect is the same. How can you, and, can you explain that a bit more, please, Dominic? You know, when you say that something like quantitative easing is a stealth tax, I mean, can you explain how, how that's so? Because the more money that the government prints, the value of the money that's in your pocket is debased. So effectively, the value of the money that's in your pocket, some of that value is transferred to the state. But, but it's diluted. Right. And the money was printed to, you know, for whatever was useful to bail out banks and so on. But the thing is, um, with this, it's just, uh, it seems, I was just thinking about this recently, it seems with, we've had quantitative easing going on for a long time. You know, people are talking about it for obvious reasons again now. But it's been yeah. going on, but we don't seem to have had that inflation. No, because um, inflation isn't properly measured. Um, inf if you look at money creation, the, the word inflation used to mean the inflation of the, of the supply of money. In other words, the blowing up, the inflating of the money supply right. with the consequence of higher prices. Now that meaning has been distorted over time so that inflation just comes to mean higher prices. Now, if you look at the how the uh, Bank of England measures inflation, it only measures um, the, the, the prices of certain consumer goods, uh, uh, um, at, which are prone to the deflationary forces of improved productivity. Mm. If you actually start to measure money supply mm. and uh, for every hundred pounds of new money that is created, only something about like about 13 percent, 13 pounds goes into the basket of goods that are measured by the Bank of England's measures of inflation. And the Federal Reserve uses similar measures. It doesn't measure the money that goes into mortgages, into into real estate, in bond prices and, and, and in all the other areas where newly created money makes its way. We just haven't seen that inflation in the real economy. But the consequence of this inflation has been this extraordinary wealth divide that has emerged in the UK. I mean, it's always been pretty bad, but it's been exacerbated since 2008, yeah. not just the UK, but America and Europe. And it's this, you know, there's lots of people that have benefited tremendously from this money creation that's got on, you know, the financial sector, the, uh, the, the, the London property market, which mostly houses the financial sector. Same goes for New York. But the people who haven't benefited it are the people that are furthest away from the issuance of new money. This is a, a process called the Cantillon effect, um, where those furthest away from the issuance of new money benefit least. Right. Um, now, so this is this is why what we've seen since 2008 is is just a tax by another name. It's a way of expropriating wealth. It's it's the reason Bitcoin was invented, you know, because it, it wanted to create a, a, a system of money that you can't debase and that can't be that can't, you can't, you know, um, uh, extract through quantitative easing. Now, what worries me about COVID-19 and the, and the state's reaction to COVID-19 is the um, money printing that's gone on is extraordinary, yeah. even by the standards of 2009. And it's like 2009 normalized money mm. printing mm. and now it's just become it's like an accepted economic policy mm. but the consequence the the, the um debasement the the loss in the purchasing power of our money that it's going to lead to is extraordinary and this time because so much of the newly printed money is making its way into the real economy you know how many people are uh, on this covid break at the moment on 80 percent of their salary just going actually do you know what i'd rather this is my son he's 19 years old he's on his year off 
He's getting paid 80% of his salary to do nothing. He's going, do you know what? I'd rather not go back to work and just be paid 80% of my salary. He does a bit of moonlighting. He makes up the other 20%. But mm. that it's just, it, this time it's making its way into the real economy. Mm. And, mm. and the, 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 we, we will see a, a tremendous loss in the purchasing power of fiat money in the years ahead, what, in my opinion. What, I mean, this is you know, talking about the, the COVID-19 I mean, we've had these reports out, uh, a, one particular report this week, talking about what we can possibly face, i.e. a contraction of the economy by 35%. Uh, the, you mentioned the Napoleonic Wars earlier. This apparently would be the biggest one since the Napoleonic Wars, um, this contraction. I, mean, I think it's even since 1709. Right, 1709. Would, the Great Freeze of 1709. That's right, indeed. Um, here we are, you know, we... We're going to have this extraordinary economic situation in, I don't know, three months, six months going on forward. How will it affect taxation? Will our taxes all go up hugely? That's what most people will want to know. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult to uh, raise taxes, raise income tax, raise um, you know, VAT, all these kind of yeah. uh, tax. You know, VAT is about 20% of government revenue. I think I can't remember the exact number. And income tax and, and national insurance accounts for about 50% of government revenue. Um, I think we'll see a couple of things. In the, in the wars, you used to see windfall taxes or profits taxes on companies that had benefited a great deal from the war, you know, munitions factories mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. It wouldn't surprise me if we see some windfall taxes on those businesses that have made good as a result of this crisis, whether it's supermarkets, mm -hmm. Amazon, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a possibility. And, you know, the there will be a lot of people who who are in favour of that. Mm -hmm. But the greatest area, the, the two big stealth taxes in our life uh, are inflation mm -hmm. And debt. Debt mm. is a tax on the future. Yeah. Um, and, you know, by golly, mm. <laughs> have we not levied a lot of debt? Yeah. Now, there are three ways that you can pay back debt. You either pay back the money or you pay back the money in in um, uh, money that's lost its purchasing power or debt jubilees and defaults. And I, I think we'll see a sort of mixture of all three. But the... Um, I can't see how they actually put up rates except for the possibly for the very rich. This idea of a land value tax, which, by the way, broadly speaking, I'm in favour of, might get a bit of traction now. Um, I'm in favour of a land value tax if it replaces other taxes. But I'm unfortunately what I think we're likely to see is a land value tax of some kind in addition mm. to other taxes. Mm. Um, the mansion tax that Ed Milliman mentioned is a sort of bastardisation of the, of, the, of the land value tax. Mm. Mm. Um, but I don't see how they put up taxes except for those people that have made good as a result of this. Are you when when we're talking now <laughs> about the future, we're talking about when when is it where the lockdown ends? You know, when this when we move to the second stage of this situation, which is what it will be. Um, I know that you describe yourself as obviously you're a libertarian. Uh, you are a believer in small government. Uh, that seems like an even further far off prospect now surely uh with what's happened over the past few weeks and months there's been sort of yeah. a, a huge sort of entry of the state hasn't there yes i'm afraid there has and you know i see brexit as and also in a way donald trump and all those things that happened in the sort of 2016 to 2018 time frame as a sort of victory for those who are in favour of smaller government and less intrusion. You know, most libertarians, not all, but most libertarians I know were in favour of, of, of Brexit. Yeah. Um, so some, there are, I can think of a few examples of people who weren't. And so it's like the small government argument. The, 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 I often see this as a, not such a battle between left and right, as a battle between author, authoritarian and, and libertarian. Mm. And the authoritarians, you know, are the technocrats and the bureaucrats and the experts who keep telling you what to do and who know better than you and so on and so forth. Um, actually, the sort of, you know, there's, there's quite a strong libertarian sentiment on the left. I think Jeremy Corbyn, socially at least, is pretty libert libertarian, for example, um, even if he's not economically. Um, 
And and I think that's why Brexit formed this weird alliance between the sort of libertarian left, the sort of Jeremy Corbyn's, if he'd actually admitted that he was a Brexit sympathiser and the Claire Foxes and yeah. Paul Embry's and people like that on the left. And then on the right, the sort of Jacob Rees-Mogg's and the Steve Baker's and these kind of people. There was this weird kind of, you know, the old school Benite left and the sort of old school Thatcherite right mm. <laughs> was weirdly aligned over Brexit. And you, it was the sort you, of you, Blairite you, middle that... You should, didn't you, yourself, Dominic, uh, as a Brexit party candidate, uh, didn't you? I, well, it, it was very. I wanted to be an MEP, but they didn't want to. They thought it would be a bit bold to have a comedian as an MEP oh. this early in the Brexit Party's evolution. So I said, "I'll oh, stick me down as an MP." But then, when the time came to be an MP, I just took so. You know, I was doing Edinburgh at the time, and people yeah. were writing horrible things on my posters, and my daughter was reading them, and it just wasn't worth the aggro, basically. Right. Right. So right. I, I stood down. Um, but the. Um, but yes. So so. The. So even though that sort of libertarian small government um, side of things perhaps won the argument, we've like almost lost or won the battle. We've kind of losing the war now because mm. we're just seeing as a result of COVID this huge land grab by by the state, by people who know better than you. And and it's it's like and and nobody's very few people are fighting back against it. And I quite frankly, I don't quite know what to do about it. But, you know, as a result of COVID, government is going to play a much bigger role in our lives, yes. even bigger role in our yeah. lives than it previously did. Yeah. And you know, one measure of this is, you know, how much, what percentage of GDP is government? And in the UK is somewhere 40 to 45 percent. Maybe you know, it depends how you measure it. The US is probably a little bit below uh, 40 yeah. percent. Somewhere like um, uh, France is like 56 percent. You know, yeah. on the wrong side of 50 percent. And Soviet Russia which is, you know, pretty totalitarian, it was only about 75% government, was only about 75% of GDP. There were still black markets and things like that. But, you know, I find it very difficult to see how as a result of this COVID, certainly by the time you factor in inflation and debt, government is, is less than 50% of GDP. So it's going to occupy a much greater part of our lives. Why do you think, uh, it seems that, you know, I'm talking very broadly here, Dominic, but even people like Reagan, for example, who came in, great believers in the small state and by implication lower tax um somehow the state always did seem to expand anyway i believe that actually under the republicans in the 1980s it it just got bigger anyway it did under thatcher yeah um it's i i think the problem is fiat money yeah it, it the like there's no discipline in government spending when government can print the money it needs or manipulate interest rates or you know get into endless cycles of debt yeah. just there isn't that same discipline that there is under a under a system of money that that is independent and that governments can't print and debase mm, i see so until we change our system of money that's going to keep on going um it's a, it's a pretty basic uh uh question really for someone who with your expertise in this area but um do you think that the the argument has sort of been one where whereby people now realize that there is no such thing as it were as government money that it is actually tax taxpayers money i mean for a long time people sort of thought oh well no the government will pay you, you actually sort of have to sort of make clear that in fact this is actually money coming from tax or when you're not talking about uh, admittedly not talking about um borrowing here but we're talking about tax money do you think people now understand that more than maybe once they did that this is actually no 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 i don't think they do and i mean there's actually one school of thought that believes that the government spends and then it taxes after it spends which is you know this this you know richard murphy is left-wing economist argues that and there's you know there's there's some justification for that mm. but the what you get like the big argument for high tax states and they go look at scandinavia mm. But what you have in Scandinavia that you don't have in the UK is that far greater levels of taxation are levied locally. Right. And the money is then spent locally. So in so as a result, there's much greater accountability and taxpayers actually see where their money is spent and are better able to hold those who spend their money to account than they are um, with a centralized system like you have in the UK. That's that's why the Scandinavian model works so well because there's far greater accountability because things are done more locally. I there's see. various other reasons why it works well as well, just because they're smaller countries, so mm. tax, smaller 
countries tend to be more efficient. Mm. You know, the smaller the size of the organisation, the more the more efficient it tends to be. So even things like their health services will be more efficient than ours simply because of the scale. Mm. But yes, like the and this is one of the reasons I argue for land value tax is it it makes the relationship between how much you are taxed and how much the government spends much more transparent and there's much more less scope for stealth taxes and and all the government spending that goes on for which they're not held accountable um Dominic, for yourself personally i mean you obviously you you know you you're a comedian um do you see that sort of career going on or are you going to sort of concentrate much more on this side of things or or say as you are uh, well, I'm, I'm kind of going to say as I am, because this the sad state of affairs, <laughs> Peter, for me, is that like COVID-19 has killed comedy. Like every single comedian has basically just on whatever date the lockdown yeah. came, I think it was a Tuesday. Yeah. I forget the date, but maybe say March the 30th, whatever date it was, comedy just stopped. Mm. And all those guys, particularly the guys, a lot of comedians live hand to mouth and their, their income just dried up. And we don't know how long comedy is going to be over for now laughter is a basic human function same as eating or breathing or mm. or you know drinking we need to laugh but live comedy has just died a total death but i'll carry on going and making my songs and so on but with the ex exception of 17 million f offs which is very popular if i post a video on youtube <laughs> of me talking about the housing market or something like that um it tends to get many more views than me singing one of my comic songs. Brilliant, though, I think my comic songs are. <laughs> so are. I think there might be more demand. <laughs> the right. market might ultimately decide that there's more demand for my financial stuff than there is for my comic stuff. But for the time being, I'm going to carry on doing both because um, I really think I'm onto something with my songs. I've, and I've written some belters and there's more There's more to come. But making one of those videos, it's, it's, it's a big undertaking. You know, I've got a... I've got to, I, I work with a friend, we compose the music together, then we've got to go into the studio, record the song. Yes. Usually there's a bit of chewing and throwing while we re-record it. Then I've got to another, get another guy in to film the video. Then we've got to edit the video. It's a big undertaking. They usually cost me quite a lot of money. And at the moment, they're a big loss-making exercise that I do for love. Right. But I do think I'm onto something with them, and, and we'll wait and see what happens. With Maybe your one day I'll, I'll be playing the O2. <laughs> <laughs> your book... Uh which is very, you very kindly uh, put the title behind you. Uh, <laughs> it's a great cue card for me, uh, Daylight it's Robbery. That, yeah, that is, um, that's available presumably on Amazon, is it? And uh, Yeah, you can buy it on Amazon or Waterstones or any or of the bookshops. Yeah, if you want to buy a signed copy, you can uh, just email me, dominicfrisbee.com, through the website there. But the bizarre thing is, this is like how, like, Penguin charge me a tenner to buy a copy of my own book and then if i then send it out that costs me three pounds 55 mm -hmm. so that's 13 pounds 55 before i've actually made any money <laughs> and amazon sell it for 12 quid <laughs> so amazon's un undercutting the author so you know but anyway if you want to buy a signed copy i sell it for the full retail price and you can buy right. it on my website but what i would recommend if you like audio books um i've spent my life doing voiceovers i'm, I'm a pretty good reader and uh, a lot of the, the audio books garnered a lot of praise. So if you like audio books, buy the audio book. All right, great. Oh, very nice tip there. Yeah, definitely to have it read by the by the author. Um, Dominic, look, thank you so much for coming on and talking about it. Um, and the paperback as well will be out next, this year, won't it? Well, I think yeah, it was supposed to be out in the spring, but it's all got delayed. So I think yes. it's out in the autumn. In the autumn now, there is a paperback that you can buy on Amazon. Don't ask me how this is, but it costs even more than the hardback. <laughs> so the, the mysteries of Amazon maybe, pricing. Maybe it's one of those way. sort of famous airport editions they do now. You know, where they're big paperbacks. Anyway, uh, th thank you very very much, Dominic, and uh, all the very best. And I hope you keep well and keep safe. And um, I will. yeah, and maybe see you again on the show quite soon. Uh, I hope so. Um, thanks very much for watching. Uh, so what you're saying is, and uh, we will see you again next time. Thank you.